Welcome to the 107th Theoretical Physics Colloquium by Achim Schwenk from uh, Technical University of Darmstadt in Germany. He received his PhD in 2002 at Stony Brook. He had a postdoctoral position at the Ohio State University uh, between 2002 and 4, and then became assistant research scientist at Nuclear Theory Center at Indiana University uh, between 2004 and 5. Became senior fellow at the University of Washington and then a research scientist in 2006 at Triumph in Vancouver where he was a deputy theory leader and then theory group leader um, until 2010. He uh, moved to um, Darmstadt in 2009, where he is a full professor since uh, that time. Um, he received several orders, uh, several honors and awards over the years, including uh, becoming fellow of the American Physical Society in 2012, um, Max Planck Fellow in 2015, and uh, he's actively engaged in professional service as Editor-in-Chief at the Journal of Physics G, Nuclear and Particle Physics. <clears throat> he's on the editorial board of European Journal of Physics A, and the editor of Nuclear Physics and Nuclear Astrophysics, uh, part of the physics reports. His research interests include theoretical nuclear physics, strongly interacting many body systems, ultra cold uh, quantum gases, nuclear astrophysics, and many other topics that I won't be able to cover all here. So today he will be talking about strong interaction matter in the universe. And with that, I'll give the microphone to Achim. Thanks a lot, Igor, for this uh, too long introduction. It's a pleasure for me to talk to you about uh, strong interaction matter in the universe. And um, um, I um, designed the talk to be hopefully theoretical colloquium level, but I think it's also um, a mixed audience. So I would be very happy to have questions on the way if you have any questions and not wait until the end. And there are certainly parts of the talk that we can jump over. Okay, so I want to talk to you about get this window closed here, strong interaction matter in the universe. Um, and uh, let me start very basic and then give you more details of what I really would like to discuss. Uh, um, and first give you an outline of my talk. Um, so I, in the first part, I would like to show you about uh, the theory that we use to describe nuclear forces, uh, namely chiral effective field theory, and where we stand in describing um, medium mass to heavy nuclei and uh, give you some successes of this theory, because it's very good to see that this theory works for um, many experimental measurements in nuclei, in the lab, also neutron rich nuclei. And then I want to switch to the theorist system of nuclear matter and uh, present uh, results for ab initio calculations of nuclear matter, so of the equation of state of strong interaction matter up to one to two times saturation density, and want to basically go through different parts of that, namely talk about cold matter, nuclear matter at finite temperature, and also get into the direction of neutron stars where the proton fraction is a function of density. And then depending on how much time I have, I would like to discuss uh, some very interesting constraints at intermediate densities, um, where information um, goes beyond uh, what we can reach from this chiral effective field theory. But we do have uh, observational in information from astrophysics, experimental information from heavy ion collisions, and some information based on uh, QCD. And I want to in particular focus on some work done here in Darmstadt uh, in the group of Jens Brown using the functional RG. And if there's a little bit of time, I can comment about uh, nuclear experiments and how they cons constrain the equation of state. OK. Um, yes, and so yeah, I saw the chat. Please ask questions. Um, Good, let me start very basic. So as you know, there are four fundamental interactions in nature, gravity, weak interaction, electrodynamics, and strong interaction. And uh, uh, this talk is about the structure of matter. So for example, if you're interested in the structure that comes out of electrodynamics, this is the per periodic table of 
the elements and I would argue that we understand very well uh, atomic structure, um, at least much better than nuclear structure, more accurately. And we understand how this new, how this uh, periodic table emerges from um, electromagnetic interactions. Uh, my talk is about the strong interactions. So at the fundamental level, QCD, and there's various level of structure formation. So you all know that quarks and gluons form hadrons. So in, inside an atomic nucleus, uh, for example, here, cartoon of the alpha particle, there are four nucleons and they of course consist of quarks and gluons but at the level that we are interested in also in the outer regions of neutron stars the relevant degrees of freedom are are hadrons neutrons and protons and interacting interactions through pions and this uh, part here um, is of course related to um, the ordinary matter in the universe or understanding uh, um, formation of hadrons and nuclei um, from QCD is related to this 5% of the energy budget of the universe. And that's what we are interested in. And at a, at a bigger level, the strong interaction is um, um, relevant for forming all nuclei. So not just the stable nuclei or the lightest nuclei, but really all nuclei. And here's a picture from this very nice article where people estimated the reach of the nuclear landscape, um, so in black shown are stable nuclei and around it in green discovered unstable nuclei, but still bound by the strong interaction. So they decay by weak interactions. And in the two lines, we can see the proton drip line on the left. So up to where um, proton rich or neutron deficient nuclei exist as bound, st bound states and on the right the neutron drip line up to where neutrons still stick to the nucleus and you can see here very um, uh, impressively that uh, there's a lot of white space around here in many regions relevant for astrophysics and in particular if you make the total count there are, there are at least as many nuclei that have not been discovered that are extremely neutron rich compared to what we know today. And one question that the uh, low energy nuclear physics community is um, um, has the goal to understand is how does this nuclear chart emerge from the strong interaction through this effective field theory. Okay, and um, this effective field theory, chiral effective field theory, has really revolutionized um, our understanding of nuclear structure. It put a lot of systematic aspects to it, understanding uncertainties, understanding many body interactions. So let me tell you a little bit about the basics of chiral EFT for nuclear forces. It was put forward by Steven Weinberg um, a bit over 30 years ago. And uh, um, it provides a systematic expansion, not in the coupling, but in momenta, uh, systematic power counting so that the theory is more and more accurate at low momenta, low generic momentum scales Q, um, and low meaning low compared to a breakdown scale, which we believe is somewhere around 500 MeV. Okay, Weinberg predicted that at leading order, so Q over lambda B to the zeroth power, there are only pairwise um, two nucleon interactions which consist of one pine exchange interactions between nucleons and shorter range, uh, two shorter range contact interactions. At the next order, there are two pine exchange interactions and there are subleading contact interactions. Okay, so this incorporates all the symmetries of a general non-relativistic theory at low energies and through the chiral Lagrangian builds in the QCD specific um, uh, symmetries or symmetry breaking it for the low energy sector. And you can think about this as a double expansion. So you expand the long range parts of strong interactions in pine exchanges. So the theory becomes more accurate as you go further in and you expand the short range um, part in terms of contact interactions. Okay, what really then um, is a, a great breakthrough here is that this theory predicts consistent many body interactions. So at uh, the next order, so Q cubed, the leading three body force was predicted actually in BRR's PhD thesis. 
And then later on, the subleading three body interactions were derived and the leading four body interactions were derived. So it's a particularly powerful for, approach for many body interactions. And because it's based on the same Cairo Lagrangian, many of the couplings that enter the two body sector or enter the pyonucleon sector can be used consistently in the many body interactions. So I want to illustrate this here for the leading three body interaction. The leading three body interaction consists of this two pine exchange, the longest range part, which has some low energy couplings here in this black square. But this black square pyonucleon vertex also enters in the contribution at the same order to the subleading two pine exchange where the second pion flies back to the first nucleon so that it can be used consistently. So for us in the many body sector, these are no new low energy constants or no new couplings. They are taken consistently to the two body sector. And then is in addition to the long range two pine exchange three body force, there's a mid range, so short long range three body force with one coupling only and a purely short range three body force with again one coupling only. So at the order Q cubed, there are only these two new couplings CD and CE which need to be fit to some few or other data, few body or other, other data. And then the um, chiral interactions can be used to predict in principle the entire nuclear chart at this level N2LO and all matter that is governed by neutrons and protons in astrophysics. Okay, now what's very interesting is that if you go to the next order, this is only one power of Q more, there are only pion exchanges. So the same consistency that held for the two pion exchange three body force holds for all pion exchange contributions here and also for all pion exchange contributions in the leading four body force. So there are no new couplings that enter here. There are no new contact interactions because to get a new contact interaction, you need two derivatives. So another power of Q further down. Okay, so actually even up to not only N2LO, but also N3LO. So the next order up to where it is shown here, there are no new couplings. And then what's particularly useful in this theory for neutron rich matter is that if you look at three neutron forces, then you can immediately realize that for neutrons, if you put three neutrons on close together as a contact interaction that does not work in an S wave because of the Pauli principle. So one neutron spin up, the second spin down, and the third neutron you have to enter with a P wave. So you need an additional, additional gradients for this. So CE does not contribute um, to neutron matter. And because the pion couples to spin, the only non-vanishing contribution to CD is when the pions couple to a spin one state here. But again, you cannot have a spin one state for neutrons uh, at the same point. So actually the only two, the only new many body couplings that enter in this theory up to N3LO do not contribute to neutrons at all. So that all many neutron interactions, all three and all four neutron interactions are predicted in chiral EFT up to N3LO. Okay, that's the real power of this chiral effective field theory that it predicts um, all operator structures and for neutron interactions, it predicts all three and four body interactions to N3LO. Okay, um, so that was kind of the timeline for Chiral EFT with the initial work of Weinberg and then Bira and many others. A more recent development that um, goes back um, now about um, seven years or so half a decade is that people have been working very hard to um, for every order to assign uncertainties based on the neglected contributions that can be estimated from this momentum expansion. And the most sophisticated way that to do that is to use Bayesian uncertainty estimates, where you make a, basically a prior distribution and prior assumption for what you believe that the low energy coefficients range, for example, uniformly distributed over natural low energy coefficients. And with this, you can then make predictions, for example, here for the two body cross section, two nuclear cross section, 
at different orders next to leading order with different 68 and 95 percent degree of belief intervals and you can check that these uh, statistical uncertainty bands improve in going to higher order N2LO, N3LO, and N4LO. And that is indeed the case. And in the two body sector, also um, uh, agreement is um, per construction very good with data. Okay, so um, from, and actually from this kind of analysis, we have the best estimates for what the breakdown scale is that this is around 500 to 600 MeV. Okay, so now we have two body and three body interactions and let's go before we go to the equation of state and neutron stars to some nuclei. And let me just show you in this uh, probably by now famous plot from Heiko Hergert from MSU about all the nuclei that have been calculated using um, what we call ab initio many body methods, namely methods that start from two and three body interactions and then solve the many body Schrodinger equation with controlled approximations that can in practice be in principle be systematically improved but are in some cases of course hard to push to the next many body level okay and so you can see here that basically these methods have tackled different methods have tackled nuclei as heavy as 100 particles so in nuclear physics we know how to approximately solve a 100 body schrodinger equation and in lower chains, for example, in the oxygen, but one could also show the calcium chain, but in the oxygen chain, there are so many methods at hand that one can really, for a given chiral interaction with a specified um, renormalization scale and so on, <clears throat> uh, we can solve the um, grounds for the ground state energy of oxygen isotopes from the proton to neutron drip lines using different many body methods all of these are many body methods that use the same input Hamiltonian. And you can see that given an input Hamiltonian, <clears throat> the many body agreement as sort of at a few, few MeV compared to 150 MeV. So a couple of percent accuracy, pre precision. <clears throat> okay. And then <clears throat> just let me tell you also that these are not interesting per calculations, just many body calculations per se, but they, for example, reveal some interesting features. <clears throat> so very loosely speaking, in the oxygen chains, we see that if we work with two body interactions only, they have enough attraction to bind nuclei. But as we add neutrons, we often overbind and that there is a net repulsive contribution from the three body force that adds more repulsion to the system as neutrons are added. This is a very similar effect to what we see for neutron matter, that when just few neutrons are there or when at lower densities, mainly NN interactions attractive, but then with increasing uh, neutrons, there's an important repulsive contribution, net repulsive contribution from the three body force. Okay. And let me highlight for this uh, region here, our most recent calculation, which is a calculation of basically the lightest 700 nuclei. This is an effort that was led by Ragnar Stroberg, now at Notre Dame, um, together with uh, Jason Holt and Johannes Simonis, where we used a method called the valence space in medium SRG to basically calculate the lightest 700 nuclei based on a given Hamiltonian. And here's, I will show you two plots. Here's just a plot that illustrates <clears throat> with some statistical significance whether nuclei are bound. So violet and blue is high confidence that they are bound. Um, white or light pink is low probability. And then you can see that this region of uh, where part where nuclei are bound agrees on the neutron deficient or proton rich side very well with a, a measured uh, proton drip line <clears throat> and on the neutron rich side it also agrees um, well with a measured neutron drip line but we see that of course we have only reached a drip line here up to neon uh, sodium region and beyond there we only know the heaviest um, experimentally measured neutron rich nucleus so these ab initio methods are really in in 
are really accelerating. And uh, this is, let's say, for the lowest 10% of the nuclear chart, a first global calculation. And actually, the biggest uncertainty is in the input interactions and not in the way that we solve these many body problems. Just, just to show you, instead of here, probability to be bound, a few more numbers. This is a, a random chain here for the chlorine isotopes at uh, photon number 17. So just going through here. Um, and you can see here neutron separation energies, experimental points are always in black bars. And the theory is the red points with its uncertainties in, in red too. Two neutron separation energies, proton separation energies, and two proton separation energies. So overall, this theory does very well. However, this is for one specific Hamiltonian, and we are now working, or the entire community is working, on getting such calculations, including also the EFT, chiral EFT truncation uncertainty included. Okay, and then let me advertise here um, as last highlight for nuclei. Um, uh, recent um, developments uh, <clears throat> by um, uh, Takayuki Miyagi and uh, Bai Shan Hu and Wei Gang Jiang and collaborators, which uh, did a first up initial calculation of LED 208. And it's basically driven by uh, Takayuki's great um, advance of being able to extend significantly the three body. Um, many body configurations that can be accessed. So um, this and up to then basically all calculations had to make a truncation of uh, three body matrix elements at a three body quantum number that everybody calls E3 max of around 18 or 16. And you can see that in a heavy nucleus like TIN 132, uh, one is far from convergence in terms of uh, size of many body configurations. But Takayuki managed to, with some clever tricks, increase these up to E3 max 28, so almost double in many body configurations in the three body sector. And you can see that these lines nicely flatten out. And this is by used by many people now. It was also used in this ab initio calculation of LED 28, which assessed the uncertainty of the input Hamiltonian by uh, using a method called history matching to sort of walk in the space of possible NN and three body interactions <clears throat> that are most likely, let's say. And you can see that they predicted many things here in comparison to experiment, which is a zero line. And in particular, they also um, calculated the neutron skin of lead and found this largest confidence interval between 0.14 to 0.20 Fermi, so which agrees with most experiments. So this ab initio calculations based on chiral effective field theory and many new many body developments has really um, done a lot for nuclear physics for finite nuclei. I just wanted to emphasize this because I now will switch gears and talk about not nuclei, but about a gigantic nucleus, namely a neutron star, which has about 10 to the 57 baryons. So very large A number, uh, but still uh, is governed by the same interactions. And the idea will be to calculate the equation of state as um, um, well as possible, coming from the outside to the inside, so increasing in density and staying in the regime of chiral EFT calculations using exactly the same interactions that have been used for uh, calculations of nuclei. Okay, so let me show you where we have more about this. So next, I then want to talk about these ab initio calculations of nuclear matter. And I first <clears throat> would like to focus on cold matter, so zero temperature matter, and also um, just on pure neutron matter and symmetric nuclear matter. So um, this is, of course, totally biased. But um, uh, I think the best calculations here uh, were done by Christian Tischler during his PhD thesis, where um, um, Christian calculated the energy per particle for pure neutron matter, which is a top panel, and for symmetric matter, energy per particle, 
at different chiral orders and included uncertainty estimates from the chiral expansion. Okay, and he did this with a new um, a way of um, evaluating energy diagrams using Monte Carlo sampling up to um, not a complete fourth order many body calculation, but including what we think is a dominant many body diagrams from fourth order. Actually, if you include only up to third order, this plot would look exactly the same. So the many body calculation seems to be well converged at these lower densities. Okay. And so let me focus first on the top chart. The top chart includes all two, three, and four body interactions up to for N2LO in the upper left here. And it includes all of these up to N3LO in the upper right. So you can so see going from N2LO to N3LO, the central values actually do not change all that much. But the band from the chiral expansion becomes, of course, much smaller because now you included the Q, um, Q to the fourth contributions and the errors are Q to the fifth from n 4 or neglected contribution. Now for neutron matter, as we discussed, my curses, as we discussed, there are no couplings that need to be fit. So the three and four neutron interactions are <clears throat> predicted. When you go to symmetric matter, that's no longer the case and you have to fit the CD and CE values to some observables. And in this calculation, we fit actually the three body CD and CE couplings to the triton binding energy and to get the calculation as close as possible to the saturation point. It wasn't a high quality fit, but just basically to get close as possible. And you can see that symmetric matter is a much more correlated system. So the uncertainties are larger, but you can see that one can reproduce uh, saturation in this way. And you can also see that up to saturation density and beyond, the chiral bands get smaller and overlap nicely. And also the central values do not change as much. Okay. Achim, so, yes. Quick question. Um, you mentioned that you need additional fit for the symmetric nuclear matter. I'm a bit confused because you said that essentially all the couplings were uh, essentially taken from the chiral perturbation theory uh, that you used before, and they were all fixed. The question for neutron matter, as we discussed, these two are not needed, right? And then the CD and CE have to be fit when you go have also protons. Okay, and in principle, you could take a light nucleus and something else. We wanted to explore the strategy to fit CD and CE to two observables. What is the triton binding energy? Because mm -hmm. that's easy to calculate and um, and in order to be um, 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 give good saturation properties, we fit um, the second observable to the empirical saturation point. Okay, there are some more recent strategies to fit to nuclei like oxygen 16 and calcium. So on this is um, an, a maybe a, a, a more expensive calculation than a triton of course, but it's possible. And then also you find similar saturation points. We just have here more our many body nuclear matter machinery. That's why we picked this one here. So I just want to emphasize these lines are not predictions of the saturation point, but they are fits to the saturation point for symmetric matter. For neutron matter, all of it is a prediction. Okay, sounds good. And then you can see here also a careful discussion of the uncertainties. One of the uncertainties was going to higher orders. And the second uncertainties are that in picking chiral interactions, you can pick different cutoff scales. So the different cutoff scales are here the different colored bands. So one cutoff scale is 450, another cutoff scale gray is 500. And you can see that the bands overlap, but there's a bigger spread at N2LO in symmetric matter. In neutron matter, there's not a big cutoff scale spread. And then the different lines correspond to doing some fits. So for example, the green curve gets a bitter, slightly better energy and the blue will get a letter, better density just to have some range. Okay, so this was not done very sophisticated, but just to show you that in addition to specifying the chiral order and the chiral uncertainties, there are more choices that can be made and there are more, let's say in this sense, maybe systematic uncertainties involved in the calculations. Okay, I want to discuss a little bit more these uncertainty bands and uh, 
um, before I do that, uh, let me just show also that not only we did calculations, but uh, many other groups um, did calculations using, I focus now on chiral interactions. Um, and here you can see a selection of calculations using both perturbative methods. And in the case of uh, Joe Lin et al's calculation, a quantum Monte Carlo calculation. So this is uh, um, Joe Lin, um, um, Alex uh, Geserlis, and um, Ingo Teves. And you can see that um, the different colored bands overlap very nicely. Exactly how the uncertainties are estimated here is a little bit different, so they shouldn't be completely the same. And also the many body calculation is different. You can see generically for pure neutron matter, um, this is pure neutron matter as a function of density. The uncertainties are small at low densities, and then they increase with increasing density. Okay, and this um, for the energy per particle looks like a big band. It's an even slightly bigger band for the pressure, which is a derivative of this quantity. And just to keep in mind for neutron stars, this would be sort of the outermost um, one to two kilometers, and um, um, uh, a curve up here would have a higher pressure, so a stiffer equation of state, and a curve down here would have a slower pressure. Okay, now um, here actually there are two curves that use these calculations before. One curve is the curve I just discussed with this simple EFT uncertainty estimates, and another uh, was using this statistical statistically interpretable uncertainty bands using the Gaussian process um, uh, base uncertainty estimates. This you can see here with the dashed lines and you can see that it's nice that the um, Bayesian uncertainties overlap with the simpler estimates. And we also check that um, in um, later neutron matter calculations is a bit easier to see that uh, these uh, Bayesian uncertainty estimates, so these are 68% confidence intervals for a particular Hamiltonian, they agree with these simple order by order estimates where you can say that the change is basically one power of Q down compared to the change at earlier lower estimates. Okay, so that's, so that's nice. And also I think it's um, good to see that, um, um, that these simple estimates give similar estimates as uh, uh, the better or statistically interpretable estimates. Okay, so then um, we want to study neutron stars with this, um, with these calculations here. And uh, that of course does not describe the entire neutron star, but just the outer regions. And for everything that goes beyond one or maybe one and a half or two times saturation density, at least for chiral EFT, the um, uh, challenge is how do you extend these uh, to higher densities? And I think the best philosophy is to take this a most as most uh, as general as possible equation of state model and then just allow all possible forms and include information we have from astrophysics. And uh, most constraining, by far most constraining experimental observable is the um, discovery of heavy neutron stars. So there are, as you know, three two solar mass neutron stars and the most heaviest is 2.08 plus minus 0.07 uh, measured from Shapiro delay. Okay, so that tells us that the pressure of neutron star matter has to be strong enough so that it can uphold um, uh, such a heavy neutron star against collapse. Okay, so the picture is basically very simply boiled down to that we need enough strong pressure against gravity. And most of the strong pressure, understanding most of the strong pressure at low density is related to this repulsive three body interaction. And for this, let me just go back a little bit here. So here you also see the unitary Fermi gas, which is basically a two body only, very strong interacting system. And you can see that the density dependence of this two body only calculation goes as n to the two thirds. And also if in these calculations, we would switch off three body forces. Most calculations would look like a, a turnover, something more like n to the two thirds. But you can see in all calculations above, let's say half or two thirds saturation density, 
there's a different density dependence that kicks in, and that is due to three body forces. So this is similar to what I discussed about uh, the oxygen isotopes, low densities, attractive two body and with increasing density, a uh, repulsive net repulsive three body contribution that increases more rapidly at high densities. And that's very important to uh, stabilize heavy stars against collapse. Okay, and let me just here uh, go back to our very old calculations where we basically took exactly this Kyle EFT band. So I want to tell you it is the green band here. So it overlaps with the better calculations, but it's a little bit broader than um, this uh, newer set of calculations. So maybe it's a little bit con more conservative. And then we said, okay, we make some polytropic extensions. Um, you could also make speed of sound extensions. There were many follow-up works that I will show you some also later. Um, and you just put two constraints on it, namely that the pressure does not increase so rapidly that you become a causal. And the pressure and the low side has to be stiff enough somewhere to support two solar mass neutron stars. And if one puts this construction, chi LFT, causality, two solar mass neutron stars into an equation of state envelope, one basically finds mass radius bands that look like this. So this does not have a statistical interpretation, but it's sort of the maximum extent. And it predicts that for typical 1.4 solar mass neutron stars, the radius goes from somewhere around 9.7 to 14 kilometers. The central densities of typical neutron stars reach at must for at most four to five times nuclear densities, and the heaviest neutron stars in this calculations reach eight times so nuclear densities. Okay, and we can also say that based on such constructions, this has also been explored by 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 others. Uh, based on such construction, one needs a speed of sound that's larger than a third at some intermediate density. So somewhere there's some stiffening in here to be able to support two solar mass neutron stars. Okay, um, let me now from this early one just to flash here how this um, nicely agrees with what LIGO then measured later. Oh, so these are the two mass radius contours. Um, they lie somewhat at lower radii, but in general, there's a remarkable consistency between chiral EFT plus massive neutron stars before LIGO and afterwards. Okay, so I, this is really very consistent. Now I want to flash uh, back a few years and show you um, um, more information. And I want to in particular also not just bring in the gravitational wave signal, but the nicer results, so nicer um, is this uh, X-ray instrument on board of the International Space Station, which looks for uh, the um, pulse that comes from basically rotating hotspots or rotating hotspot regions on a neutron star. And if the neutron star is more compact, meaning either smaller radius or heavier mass, then you can track this pulse, this hotspot region also behind the neutron star, and you have a pulse profile that never um, stops. So you always see it. Whereas if the neutron star is more um, with weaker gravity effects, it, the hotspot will dif disappear behind the neutron star and then only reappear later so that the pulse profile looks very different. Okay. And this combined with modeling of hotspots allows nicer or allows two groups within NICER to make um, extractions of mass radius um, likelihood regions. And uh, um, there are two neutron stars that have been um, measured in this way so far. The first one, 0030, was a neutron star for which the mass is not known. So NICER um, provides um, simultaneous mass radius measurement, but as a result, not a very um, precise measurement. And the more interesting second source is uh, this very heavy 2.08 neutron star. So where the mass in principle is known from um, pulsar uh, measurements, and it can be folded into this analysis as well. 
and now it's a constraint on the radius and that's um, the 68 and 95 percent confidence interval shown here okay and you can already see here that this also is a little bit more towards larger radii compared to um, the gravitational wave event okay and we together with uh, get Rajmikers and the Amsterdam group we uh, did a combined uh, merger and nicer constraint analysis using one construction this piecewise polytrope model that I presented to you in the previous slide as a baseline and another ensemble that uses a speed of sound construction so we're there again the philosophy is to pick general extensions but not with piecewise polytropes here where you basically spy, spline the equation of state region, but where you make a model, model curves in speed of sound space. Okay, and you can see uh, in the top panel here that um, both of them give, if you compare just the green solid regions, give very similar radii that sort of are evening out around 12 kilometers for neutron stars okay you can also see from these curves that if you just look at the <clears throat> masses so radio pulsars and the information from uh, gravitational waves they pull a little bit more to the smaller radii and if you add in nicer it moves things a little bit to the right again so this gets pulled to the left and moves or is at the left and then pulls to the right again. So there's a little bit of pushing, pulling a little bit in both directions, but of course, within statistical uncertainties, it's all consistent. And now I want to come back to the question whether we start to learn something about the equation of state in this regime close to Kyle EFT. And to explore this in this paper here, in this later paper, we explored um, both in the piecewise polytope and in the uh, speed of sound but I just show the piecewise polytope here um, ensembles that start from the four different chiral EFT bands that are mentioned here so they are the same ones here and then we for piecewise polytope use the same piecewise polytope extension and then we are interested in at some region at densities where we don't use Carl EFT, but where, where in principle we think we can get to calculating, namely one and a half times saturation density or twice saturation density. We look at where um, taking these um, um, ensembles and folding in the astro information where one comes out. And this is shown here by comparing the priors, which without the astro information, the dot dashed histograms. Um, against the posteriors which are the filled in regions and you can see that for all of these Kyle EFT calculations folding in astrophysics pushes one towards stiffer equations of state so there it's still broad at one and a half times saturation density but it's not as broad as this general construction or we can have based on Kyle EFT also lower pressures what's shown here is the posterior for the pressure at one and a half times saturation density I'm sorry and at twice saturation density, this becomes even more pronounced that the posteriors with the astro information all are on the lower side of the uh, uh, pressure um, uh, distributions, whereas the priors are much broader. So I think this is very interesting because it tells you that from astro uh, information, one can infer uh, something about the equation of state of neutron stars at one and a half and twice saturation density in this region where in Kyle EFT our bands are starting to get very large. So this, I think as a next step besides just um, going to um, um, equation of state space, maybe we can learn also something about dense matter interactions in these regions. Okay, so with this, um, I would like to stop the cold part and in the remaining uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, tell you maybe just a little bit about these newer developments and then make some remarks about intermediate densities. And then in the interest of time, I will skip the last part. Um, okay, uh, let me uh, start on finite temperature first. So uh, 
For finite temperature, it's also possible to do chiral EFT calculations. And there are two different calculations that we've done early on with a postdoc, Ayana Carbone, using self-consistent Green's functions. Uh, so this is the free energy per particle as a function of density with increasing temperature. And a more recent study with uh, uh, a PhD student, Jonas Keller, and former postdoc, Corbinian Weldenhofer, looking at many different interactions at up to 20 MeV or so. And you can see all the finite temperature stuff is actually very well under control. And there's a physics reason for this in these chiral calculations here. So you can see that uh, using many different interactions, uh, this uh, is um, a pretty small region for the free energy for neutral matter at 20 or tens of MeV temperatures. Okay, and what's basically behind this is very nicely analyzed by looking at what is just the contribution that comes from thermal effects. So think about this free energy or the uh, pressure as having a contribution that's basically the cold part T equals zero part and top and on top of this a thermal contribution. What's plotted here is just the thermal contribution. Um, just that comes from thermal excitations or quasi particle excitations. And you can, this is neutron matter. And you can see here at, for neutron matter at low densities, the thermal contributions basically look like a free Fermi gas. The reason for this is that at low density, the quasi particles in neutron matter have basically an effective neutron mass that's basically the bare mass. And then if you increase uh, the density, you see a significant deviation and an interesting deviation from this free gas contribution and the thermal pressure decreases. We will also see this later. You can also analyze this in what's called the thermal adiabatic index, which is often used in astro simulations. And you can see again that low densities, the thermal index is five thirds, and then it decreases. And this thermal index, if you assume that the thermal contributions are purely from quasi particles, so let's say just weakly interacting quasi particles with an effective mass and assume the effective mass is temperature independent, but just depends on density. Then you can derive that the thermal adiabatic index has this form. It's basically given by the density dependence of the effective mass. And this is fully consistent. So the effective mass is for neutrons at low densities, basically the free mass, and also for moderate densities, very close to the free mass. Look at the scale here. And then it decreases first from attractive two body interactions and it increases from repulsive three body interactions. Okay, and this model works very well with this picture that thermal excitations are basically from the qua weakly interacting quasi particles with a given effective mass. We, we, you can describe essentially our complicated ab initio calculations by knowing what the effective mass is. Okay, uh, I will skip a slide, but just to tell you here that this effective mass is actually an interesting effect. So for, for simulations, these are core collapse supernova simulations. And you can see that for equations of state that have no effective mass like Latimer Svesti, which basically all the neutrons always have the bare mass. The proton neutron star contracts uh, quickly. And for other calculations that have had lower effective mass, like 0.8 at saturation density or 0.65 at saturation density, the thermal pressure is higher and it keeps the proton neutron star from contracting slower so they contract slower and this has an imp interesting effect on the simulations okay so with this um, i may then come to a, a more recent work um, that we put on the archive a few months ago um, where we not only wanted to look at uh, finite temperature but also arbitrary proton fraction okay and so we here use the same interactions up to n3lo that i showed you before from uh, in our work with uh, Christian Drischler, but we did calculations now at different temperatures, 0, 10, 20. We could also go higher, but just uh, we covered this lower temperature side. And we did calculations at arbitrary proton fractions, so pure neutron, 10% proton symmetric matter. And we went up to third order, and just maybe you can see it in some calculations, like here, Hartree Fock first order 
second order dot dashed, I hope you can see it, and solid third order and the uncertainty of the third order chi LFT uncertainty band. Okay. Um, and then, so what you do is you basically calculate the free energy. And then, of course, we want to use this uh, produced data to calculate a lot of things, calculate the pressure, calculate the speed of sound, ideally calculate matter, not just in fixed proton fraction configuration, but in neutron star matter. And to do that, it's um, very useful to use um, a measure from machine learning, a, a Gaussian process as basically an interpolator of the data. And this is what you can see here. So we train the Gaussian process on the calculated data points, for us, uh, theory data points. And the uh, um, uh, Gaussian process used basically as an emulator of the data as the started line. And the Gaussian process has the great advantage that it's you can basically get all the derivatives for free. So once you train the Gaussian process on the, um, on on your grid in density, proton fraction, and temperature, you can not only interpolate to arbitrary proton fraction and arbitrary temperature and arbitrary density, but you can also calculate all possible derivatives. Okay, so this is perfect for setting up an equation of state. And um, let me just show you a couple of highlights and I skip some things. One of the highlights was if you look at the pressure, um, the pressure bands are now larger, but there's an interesting effect in the pressure. So now these are all based on the um, Gaussian process emulator uh, because we take it as a derivative of the free energy. And you can see a very interesting effect, which is there in all calculations and for all of the Hamiltonians we studied. And to describe the effect, let me just look at some intermediate density. So here, the blue line, uh, inter excuse me, intermediate proton fraction. The blue line here is the uh, zero temperature line. So the zero temperature pressure increases. And then if you go to higher temperatures, you see that the pressure at low densities is higher, but at high densities, the pressure of hot matter is actually lower. And so there's this crossing of pressure isothermals at higher densities. It's, it's there everywhere in neutral matter. It's also across, it's just not so severe. And this comes basically from this effective mass effect that the effective mass decrease, increases from the repulsive three body contribution. So we find in all calculations, usually also different Hamiltonians, that there's this negative thermal expansion at densities beyond saturation. And it would be very interesting to see what it does in simulations or maybe what it does in heavy ion collisions. <clears throat> uh, and then we can also take the Gaussian process as an emulator to access arbitrary proton fraction. So we can basically solve for beta equilibrium using the Gaussian process. We can determine the proton fraction for zero temperature matter. It's actually very narrowly, this is the N3LO uncertainty band, very narrowly predicted, uh, higher temperatures, it looks a little bit similar to Latimer Svesti, but it's not as strong. Okay, but so typical 5% proton fraction. And then we can use this to calculate the pressure now for the first time in beta equilibrium directly. So this is not some <clears throat> parametric interpolation between neutron and symmetric matter, but it uses the Gaussian process to calculate the pressure at uh, zero temperature, for example, at for every proton fraction, that's the actual proton fraction of beta equilibrium. And then you can see these bands here, the narrow dark blue band, darker blue band at N3LO, the lighter blue band at N2LO, remarkably consistent. So there's no indication for the breakdown of chiral interactions up to here. And you can see what's nice is also, if I could just point your attention to here, if you compare at saturation density R and R calculations for matter directly in beta equilibrium, we are also on the higher side of the pressure. So this is a little bit similar. We have to analyze this better, but this is a little bit similar to what I described here. So I think many things are coming together. And uh, Igor, maybe this is a good point 
to stop or do you want to hear something about intermediate densities? Well, it's really up to you. If you want to do it in a couple of minutes, uh, go ahead. Otherwise, we can stop here. Let's stop and then we can, if there's interest, I could show a slide. That's okay. maybe better for everybody. Okay, thanks. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for a nice presentation. Uh, now we'll have some time for questions. So if you have questions, please raise the hands. Uh, Mark, Mark Alford was first, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I have, I have uh, a couple of questions. So one, one was in the last thing you talked about, the beta equilibrated matter. So were you assuming that neutrinos just escape and are, are not not around yes okay so if you're assuming that at temperatures like 10 MeV or so then what what um, what beta equilibrium condition did you use I mean we just assumed the chemical potential of the neutrinos is zero so you assumed mu n equals mu p plus mu e right ah okay so I guess I should talk but to you about that because there are in, at least in a neutron star, there are corrections for that. Yes. And and the nice thing about this um, um, Gaussian process, Mark, is that we could include all of these corrections and we don't have to rerun the calculation. We just have to rerun the Gaussian process, which is very cheap compared to calculating all these many body points. So right. We, yeah, I know. I noted down your thing about using the, the Gaussian interpolator, because I think that's going to be very useful for lots of people. Um, can I ask another question? Please go ahead. So um, just going back to the earlier part of the of the talk, um, you said that the speed of sound has to go above one third, right? How how dependent is that conclusion on the sort of cutoff density up to which you use chiral EFT and where you then switch to to the sort of polytropes or whatever? Um, uh, in our, just to clarify, in our calculations, we switch to polytropes at a little over saturation density. So we don't, um, we don't, we, we, we were very careful to trust these uncertainty bands. Um, okay. So I guess you're, um, you, you don't need to sort of pretend that chiral EFD is good up to a particularly high density in order to get no. that conclusion. It, it just yes. drops out. Yes. I think if one is um, in it, a little bit of the statement depends on which ensemble you exactly use. And I think I remember that some people find in their millions of equation of states, like also for our polytropes, there could be a few isolated, very fine tuned configuration that might just scratch a third, right. but overall, um, if oh, um, the biggest, if you would put 68 or 95 percent confidence contours around this, you would uh, go above it. Okay. And okay. actually, this is maybe a perfect time if you allow me to also just show another slide. Um, I wanted to sh show this here. Maybe I show it here or here. This is a speed of sound for symmetric matter in our chiral calculations. So um, at saturation density, the pressure is uh, zero, right? So um, um, that's why this uh, um, uh, um, goes down here. Um, and then um, in the asymptotic regime here, of course, the PQCD calculations tell you that the pressure close to one third and the speed of sound is close to one third and it approaches the speed of sound from below to one third. And I find particular interesting here these um, functional RG calculations. Of, of course, there are many truncations involved, but Jens group, uh, so um, this is a paper from Mark Leonhardt and collaborators and I know our cal cal calculations by uh, Benedict Schalmo and Jens. This group found that if you um, use the functional RG and you include dichroic correlations, the speed of sound has this bump it's not really super high above one third, but it is above one third. And they have this interesting paper where they uh, show that if one includes dike work correlations, the speed of sound is also significantly higher 
than if you would calculate purely based on perturbative QCD. And so maybe that's a model of how to get at intermediate densities, larger speeds of sounds. Okay, so just one more very small thing I wanted to ask about is, so at the other end, low densities, very low, like below half saturation density, I'm assuming that you switch to some sort of inhomogeneous equation of state or something. Yes. You're not using chiral effective theory anymore. Yes. Yes. You didn't say that, but I assume you just did that. Yes, we do. We switched to a crust. Right. And early on, we used the BPS crust. In this analysis uh, for NICER or in this lead up papers with the, the Amsterdam group, we also explored different crusts and that impacts radii at a level of below 100 meters. So there is some uncertainty, but that's not a major uncertainty. Uh, and actually, in order to do the matching for us, um, yeah, um, most of these crust models go through this chiral band down here. Then, so it doesn't need to. There doesn't have to be a sophisticated matching that's being done. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, Paul Frampton, please. You have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I have a couple of questions. Um, and I must preface it by saying I'm a particle theorist who thinks only of quarks and not so much nucleons. But in the first half of your talk where you were discussing the uh, nuclei up to 100 nucleons and so on and get such impressive results. The input interactions into your whole effective field theory are, yes, that sort of thing, yes, are um, uh, interactions of nucleons, right, with ions, right. Um, as proposed by Weinberg 30 years ago. And uh, uh, now, when you get to, for example, the center of a neutron star, uh, as you indicated, then the quarks themselves become uh, very relevant, right? So then you have to use a different um, chiral effective field theory with quarks, do you? No, and we just use this theory oh, here. We use this theory to do the following to calculate up to a density where the uncertainty bands are still under control. So maybe I, if I show that the last one again here, so you can see that saturation density is somewhere here. So still very well under control uncertainty bands. Um, so you could push this higher to one and a half or so maybe. And then from that point on, if you put this pressure versus density, this increasing band in a log plot, then it's basically a, um, an equal width band here. And from then on, we just basically spline the equation of state space because we don't know what the relevant degrees of freedom are and what their interactions are. And I mean, coming out from Kyle EFT here, um, it will take a, I mean, the, um, uh, yeah, I, this was more in the part that I skipped. Uh, so the, the calculations that use quarks and that are really under control are perturbative QCD calculations, but they are limited in applicability from the calculation itself down to let's say 50 times saturation density from the high end. Okay, so in principle, if you want it, you could, this is around 10 times saturation density, go significantly higher. And at 50 times saturation density, there's a PQCD constraint. And this matching does provide some information that feeds back down, but um, I did not talk about this. In this region here from one to 10 times saturation density, there are really, I would say, no reliable calculations that start from anything. I see. And, uh... Uh, I mean, the degrees of freedom here that we would worry about first is maybe delta excitations, maybe having 
uh, high pawns. I mean, it will be more hadronic coming in from the low side than than to talk about quarks right away. Yes, I see. Another question, a different question is, in this um, LIGO discovery of the merger of two neutron stars, uh, to what extent does that shed light on uh, the questions about, for example, the equation of state and so on, if at, if at all? Yeah, there's a lot of papers on this subject, of course. Um, um, so, I mean, to give you a lot, I think I have one. This is a recent paper that discusses basically the information from heavy ion collisions, but I can use this slide here just to show you what the astrophysics information is. Um, this is based on a prior ensemble where you basically do this construction using a Chi RDFT band up to one and a half times saturation density in this calculation, and then extending it with a speed of sound construction. So it's crust, Chi RDFT up to one and a half, speed of sound, general extension. And then you get a prior. And so, for example, this gives for the prior of the radius of a typical solar mass neutron star here, this range from 10.8 to 13.2 kilometers. This is Chi RDFT, just Chi RDFT. Then this next largest constraint is to include the information that two solar mass neutron stars exist. Um, this then um, gets you this range. And then the gravitational waves always pull also a little bit towards the lighter. Sorry, this is uh, <laughs> a bit tricky. Uh, towards the smaller radii. So, so there is information, very useful information from the tidal deformability. Um, um, and it um, points, it is consistent with our information from Kyle EFT plus a heavy ma mass neutron star. Um, and it slightly prefers, but this is really slightly given the uncertainties, prefer a smaller um, radii. Okay, and then you can see that nicer compared to uh, the gravitational waves like to pull a little bit up, but this is, uh, I mean, you should keep these statements in mind on top of an uncertainty range that is relatively large. Overall, it's, we also want to stress that it's remarkable that this nuclear theory or Chi LFT, which includes data, of course, information from nuclear forces, and this general extension is so consistent with what um, LIGO saw. Mm -hmm. And you just have to keep in mind that with the next um, advanced LIGO and future instruments, we will observe many more of these events. So that will add a lot of data to this inference. And the same is, of course, true with NICER. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on to the next question then. Uh, Kai Zhu, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, maybe I missed this point from your talk. So if you want to combine the measurement from heavy inflation and also the neutron star observation to do a joint inference on equation of state, you know the matter created in heavy ion and the matching neutron star, they have the isospin difference. So do you make the conversion trying to do this joint analysis or not? No, we basically do the joint analysis by using the inferred equation of state constraints that, that come out of the modeling of the heavy ion collision. So I can show you uh, somewhere. I have this plot here. This is basically for, for this particular work here by Sabrina Hood and Peter Peng and collaborators. Um, we include information from the modeling of heavy low energy heavy ion collisions that accesses cold and uh, denser matter at GSI in particular from this RC AOS experiment and their most likely region if you translate this into pure neutron matter is given by this uh, red region so you can see it's most constraining around saturation density 
it actually also prefers the higher densities going to higher densities, higher pressures going higher, excuse me, higher um, stiffer equation of state going to higher densities. And then the range becomes bigger at lower densities because of course that, 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 that information doesn't come out of the modeling of this collision. And then basically we use, um, so there's an underlying equation of state space and we use the information from Chi DFT, so that would be this first bar, and then from heavy ion collisions extracted from the extraction from heavy ion collisions as information on top of all the astrophysics stuff. And, and that is shown here in this plot here from this recent paper, uh, where you again see that uh, um, what's, what's basically in here, that uh, this particular extraction from heavy ion collisions um, is um, um, is preferring somewhat slighter stiffer equation state. And this is also what you can see here. If you, and this may be a busy plot, if you compare the prior uh, and the Hick part, then you can see our prior has a region that goes also down, but the Hick likes to have uh, more probability further up. Okay, so basically you didn't specially care the isospin difference. That was basically, no, we do care very much about the isospin difference and we need to translate the information from this experimental um, inference on the equation of state into constraints on neutron matter, constraints from FOPI for symmetric matter, and then um, translating also this to neutron star conditions with uh, high How you did proton. this transformation? You have this um, isospin dependent transformation yeah. or? We basically include this through an equation of state uh, um, parametrization where the, uh, loosely speaking, the symmetry energy is kinetic plus quadratic contributions. And then we included okay. uncertainties in the ranges of the symmetry energies that are based on the chiral calculations and empirical information. Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other questions? Any other questions? Well, I do have a question of my own. Um, at some point when you were comparing the equation of states at zero and finite temperature, you had that interesting crossing of the pressure at some density where the higher temperature had slow, uh, lower pressure. Yes, this um, it's a bit counterintuitive. I mean, mathematics can give you this, but what's your interpretation? Is that an indication that the equation that the, something's wrong with the equation of state, or no, there is a thermodynamically true allowed? I mean, it's thermo there's nothing. It's it's not a physically unallowed region, or so. I mean, the pressure is always positive, but the pressure just um, decreases as you increase the temperature. It goes under the buzzword negative thermal expansion. So, so if there are some, con if you look at water, water ice, there are some conditions in um, where the where water ice also has this negative thermal expansion behavior. So it's not against thermodynamics, but it's against your intuition that normally if you heat up the system, the pressure increases. So exactly the point. Uh, is there an intuitive understanding what's driving it? That's exactly yeah, what, what is I'm driving. What's driving it is that uh, is that is this repulsive contributions. Look at this plot here. Um, this is the thermal. Now we look again at the thermal pressure, and it's a there's a big range. So actually, where this exactly happens is has a large uncertainty. But generically, the behavior is there for lots of interactions that we explored. This is the thermal pressure as a function of density. The blue stuff is pure neutron matter. There so you can see also here, we start to get into this point where the thermal pressure is zero. So then it goes down right here. Um, and for neutron, for symmetric matter, that's the red stuff. And so there in the red stuff, this happens quicker. Okay, and now I want to go back to this earlier slide, which I discussed more. So that was this thermal pressure. Mm -hmm. We just didn't show it all the way to zero here. And uh, this thermal pressure is basically consistent with, you can describe this thermal pressure 
by assuming the gas system is an ideal gas of quasi particles with a density dependent effective mass. And as soon as you make the density effective dependent effective mass increase again with density, then you get this effect. And for us, that comes in the calculation out of the repulsive three body forces. So uh, basically you can get thermodynamically, you can easily generate it by having <clears throat> uh, a weakly interacting gas of quasi particles that has an effective mass that first decreases and then increases with density. In our calculation, that is the case. And on this plot, we don't have a plot with just NN interactions, but we already saw it in the paper with Ariana Carbone. It's, it's very nicely in there. And if, you were, if we were to do a plot here of just two body interactions, the effective mass would continuously to go down like what you kind of expect from a mean field picture. Right. And then we get attractive interactions. And then we get this increase from the three body force. Okay. And that's what's driving this. And this is a plot here for pure neutral matter in symmetric matter. This um, uh, increase is also there. The effectiveness does not go above one, but it's what's relevant is the increase because this derivative matters. So uh, thermodynamically it's allowed. Uh, water has it, other systems have it, but it's counterintuitive and it um, it, it can be generated from particular density dependencies of the effective mass. Right, right. The, the, the reason, I guess, uh, it appears counterintuitive, I'm not arguing about thermodynamic consistency, obviously, apparently contradicting uh, the, the fact that, yes, the mass naturally would uh, be expected to drop down so that at some point you have essentially a restoration of chiral symmetry. And somehow when you have this mass increasing, as if saying that the Carl symmetry breaking gets stronger, that's that's perhaps yeah. the most acute sort of contradiction that I feel appears. Yeah, in but this. we are really very far away from any chiral symmetry breaking, right? Because this is happening just above saturation density okay. and the neutron effective mass is not related to somehow the mass of the hadrons turning zero because of chiral symmetry restorations, just because the system is very correlated mm -hmm. and the neutrons and protons are really particles that move through this interacting soup of dense matter and that dresses the particles and uh, I mean, as we know from Fermi liquid theory, these type of thermally excitable quasi particles are the dominant excitations. And the question is just, um, yeah, whether this is really there. And um, I would be interested to hear from um, like heavy iron community or so whether uh, some, if one plugs in something like this into a transport simulation, what happens or hydro simulation, what would happen? Right, right. I can I... also say that I didn't show this, but just to your um, um, that, that uh, as a demonstration that everything is healthy, we also, of course, calculate the liquid gas phase transition. Mm -hmm. And this looks very consistent. This happens at lower densities. Mm -hmm. So we get a critical point at around 15 MeV temperature. But this is this all looks good. So there's I mean, I, um, I think the yeah. Um, um, nothing looks unnatural, but it's an, an, an int intriguing effect that we didn't, um, um, that we were not aware of, which has also, but which has however been seen actually in basically all finite temperature calculations, the few that are there for symmetric matter. Right. Great. Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Well, um, I do have another question myself, though. Uh, if uh, I was just wondering about this transitional region where the EFT presumably breaks down, your blue line ends, and then you go into this unknown region where the uh, speed of sound becomes larger than uh, one over square root of three. And I was just wondering, um, you you didn't push your Carl uh, perturbation theory that way because it breaks down, but is this a potential mechanism, this uh, the increasing mass as a function of density that may, no. why not? I mean, I, I, uh, we don't see that yet, but just to show you the, the magnitude of speed of sounds we get in this chiral regime, chiral EFT mm -hmm. regime, it's a non-relativistic effective field theory, right? So it's and very the small speed of sound, 
yeah, the, the, the zero temperature line is a blue line. Mm -hmm. So it's so even up at point two, you can see where this kind of going, right? So um, that, that doesn't get you even close enough to one third. Right, right, right. Yeah, uh, the, the thing is that nobody knows why that uh, stiffening happens. And I was just wondering if, a, if an analog or something of this three body repulsion may do it. Yeah, like you could have very not. strong repulsion, repulsive interactions, but in the um, uh, in this in this regime where the Kyle EFT error uncertainties are under control, we 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 don't have one yet. Yeah. I, I also think it's very unnatural to get something like this in a non-relativistic regime. Right. Okay, great. Thanks. Any other questions before we uh, close questioning? I don't see any raised hands, so I would like to use this opportunity to thank him again for a very nice presentation.